I want you to help me welcome our keynote for tonight, Mr. Romero Magaña. Part of my identity. 
So coming to this country, I had to let go of my hand. And so, was it easy? No, it was probably really, really hard. However, I had to let go. And when I came to Fillmore High School, Fillmore Middle School, within a year, I was told that I was going to get to know Cholos and to be careful with the Cholos because I could join in again. And I remember somebody telling me, <clears throat> you're going to be a Cholote. What's a Cholote, right? A big Cholo, big gang member, right? And so, so I was like, how am I going to become a big gang member? Right? I mean, I'm coming from El Rancho, whole different lifestyle, and I'm going to become a Cholote. Yeah, within a year, I was walking, you know, like. <laughs> and within the first year, I got introduced to music such as music from like Snoop Doggy Dog, the album 1993, I remember buying it in the swap meet to listen to that cool music. And I didn't understand any English, but it was just cool because my friends who were English learners, who had been here in this country for less than a year, were already listening to that music. So then, after a year of being in this country, you know, I was I put, I put acclimatating to our not assimilating, but acculturating to the culture, to the system, to the language. So then in ninth grade, I remember being in the classroom in math, and a student touched my private, my behind. And so I turned around, and I asked my best friend. My best friend said, hey, ¿quién fue, wey? Who was it? And he's like, oh, it was my, this other friend. So I trusted my friend, and I go to the other friend, Talking about self-control, I'm like, ¿Quién fue? I hit him, I, who was it? And I hit him on the head. And so I didn't have no self-control. I can also learn how not to have self-control at that time yet. My parents either. So I was used to a rancho, right? So I hit him on the head, he gets up, and he's taller than me. I'm like, oh my God, right? So we get into a fight inside the classroom, and I get suspended for three days. When I went to the assistant principal, he says, Homero, if you keep fighting in school, you're going to um, not be able to go to college. So at that time, I had no idea what was college. I had no idea what it was all about. So I was like, okay, I don't care. But when the intervention happened, was when I got home. And my parent, my dad said, Ben, get over here. I said, I brought you to this country to succeed, not to fail. I brought you to this country so that you can have a better education than me. I don't want you to be working on the fields like me. You continue to be fighting in school the way you are doing it now. I'm going to take you out of high school and you're going to work with me for the rest of your life picking lemons and oranges. Now, I already at the age of 7th and 8th grade, I had started working with my dad picking lemons and oranges. So I knew what it was like to pick lemons and oranges. So today, I brought a little sample for you. So, picking oranges and lemons is, you know, you could say easy work. Yeah, but when it is on a margarita, right? <laughs> when you're picking a margarita, the lemons are easy. But carrying an 80 pound bag full of lemons, full of oranges, and then you're in 8th grade, 9th grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, first year in college, it becomes heavy. And you realize that waking up, at 5, 6 in the morning to go all the way to Bakersfield and pick oranges, it becomes really, really hard. To pick lemons, it becomes really hard. So when my dad gave me that talk and said, you better start working in school, I sent you to school to learn. Right? <laughs> I sent you to school to learn. I want to have an education. I only have a second grade education. So that's when it really hit me. I was the oldest of seven or five, four sisters, and I was the oldest, and I had a sister that was handicapped. She had an indictment when she was one month old in Mexico. And so due to the lack of money and where we live, there was not enough medical care to help her out. So that's the reason why when we came to this country, my dad was working here on the fields for seasonally. He would work for nine, 10, 11 months, and then he would go back to Mexico. When Ronald Reagan, Pass, helped pass the amnesty bill of 1996 that allowed my dad in 1993 to get our visas for all of us and come to this country. 
So when we came to this country, you know, we came with the idea that we're going to stay with my dad, we're going to be able to be close to him. And school was a priority, but it was not the main priority. Going to college was not the main priority. The priority was survival. Be able to go to school, learn as much as you can, and as soon as you got there from high school, you're going to start working. So this was going to be my job, even after I got there from high school. I knew that I was going to be picking lemons and oranges after I got there from high school, because I was just there for the moment. But then something happened. So you can click on the next slide, please. So, emotional intelligence. I don't know about you, but the reality is that we as people, we learn, we are social people, we learn through others. We learn so many things. And so for me, when I started joining all these sports, that I decided to focus on my, you know, soccer, I started with El Guayeso. And people would say, El Guayeso, you know, that's basic soccer, right? Yeah, but you know, for me, it was like being in the Mexican national team. <laughs> for me, I wanted to become a professional soccer player. I wanted to be, you know, the next. <laughs> Pretty good. Um, I wanted to be a professional soccer player. So for me, being able to play AYSO soccer, it opened so many doors. I scored 16 goals in nine games. I felt like Messi. <laughs> but you know, Messi in Fumo, right, in AYSO. And so as I began playing soccer, I gained the confidence that, yeah, that's me with a mullet. <laughs> that was my style back then in Mexico. So it was like the right thing to do at the time playing soccer and play, having long hair. Then, my PE teacher said, Omero, you're always running in PE. You're always running in PE and you don't stop, you just keep running. Why don't you run track and field and cross country? Now, I don't know what are your professions here in this school district. And it doesn't matter what profession you have, but every day, usually all of us have interaction with different students. And we have to be in the network of connecting our students to their talents and skills that sometimes they don't even have, right? So for me, my PE teacher would say, you have to join uh, track and field in cross country and make sure that, you know, you run because you have a talent. You're always running PE. Don't take PE anymore. So finally, I listened to that, that teacher and my sophomore year, I ran track and field instead of doing, actually, think about this. I had to do PE and then run track and field after school because the master schedule was not created for me as an English learner to take sport class experience. <clears throat> my ELD3 and my ELD4 class were six period. And so I was not eligible or able to take six period track and field like everybody else. And on top of that, I lived in Rancho Ceste between Fillmore and Pyro. So I had to commute on the bus because my dad was not able to take me. So talking about resiliency and not being able to give up when you have a passion for something. So I took track and field, cross country, and I played soccer. And I remember um, when I joined cross country, we went to Stanford Invitational. Stanford Invitational, right? And so I had no idea I was Stanford Invitational, but I was excited that I was gonna go to run far away from home. Right? So I went, we ran, after two years of running cross country, by the end of the, my first year, I became the number two runner in the high school. Going from number seven to number two. Almost just like the movie McFarlane. Right? I was kind of like, I was like Danny, number seven. Then I became number two. We should go Danny was number five, right? Or number six. But number five. And so for me, cross country became a big passion. Then track and field. But then in my junior year, a bilingual instructional assistant at Fillmore High School said to me, Omero, why don't you go to an FLA camp? I said, an FLA camp? No, I, I have a track and field meet this Saturday and I'm going to get a medal. I don't wanna go to a camp. And she says, you know, you gotta go to this camp, it's gonna be good for you. You're gonna learn a lot of things about being a leader and self-esteem. And I have no idea what, what she was talking about. And so I said, no, I don't want to go. And I said, my coach won't let me. My coach wants me to run track and 
be all right and get a medal and help the team. No, she said, I'll talk to your coach. I said, oh my God, I don't want to to talk to the coach. My parents won't let me. And she's like, I'll talk to your parents. So she didn't give me a way out. So then she recruited more friends and we went as a group to the FLA camp. As Vanessa said, when I went to the FLA camp in 1998, I met an amazing amount of Latino students who had the power and the, and, the, and the desire to go to college and become the first ones in the families to go to college and, and become the future leaders of America. And so it inspired me. It inspired me in ways that I never thought that I could be inspired. So after that, I was selected to go to Washington, D.C. in 1998 and, and go for 10 days and stay in Washington, D.C. and learn about the political system. Wow, that was just amazing. Then after that, you know, I came back to Fillmore High School really excited and everything and started doing even better academically. And I remember graduating from uh, Fillmore High School um, my last year with a 4.7 GPA or 16. It was just like, why is that? Why is that? Because I took an AP Spanish literature class. My coach from cross country and track and field would say, you gotta take Spanish. No, I can't. Why do I take Spanish? I already know how to speak Spanish. No, you should take it because when you go to college, it's going to be good for you. So finally, I took eventually AP Spanish 4, AP Spanish 5, passed both exams. And so when I went to Mopar College, I was able to get like 16 units credit. And so, talking about again, a teacher making a, a, an influence on me to take Spanish. For me, I wanted to take wood shop instead. I wanted to learn how to cut the wood and I was there for one semester and I loved it. And so when I went to my counselor and said, can you please give me Spanish for native speakers? She said, well, you already know how to speak Spanish. No, but I, my teacher, my coach said that I should take it. Okay. So I took Spanish for native speakers. It became one of the best skills I have had to this day because it has allowed me to work professionally as a bilingual professional school counselor. And so talking about emotional intelligence, people around you develop that on you. If I would stay in the rancho, just socializing with the people that work in the rancho, I would develop emotional intelligence about surviving in that kind of lifestyle. But being able to survive in a different lifestyle, it's so important for our students. Can you continue, Tyson? <coughs> so, for English learners, I experienced many different issues. And Tyson, on this one, you have to click one by one. So one of the issues that I experienced, listening to the music of Snoop Dogg Dogg and having no clue, and leave it kind of my music for a little bit, right? Number two, talk to Sue's books. I remember getting books from Dr. Sue's for my first Christmas in the United States, and I had no idea what were those green eggs and ham. It didn't make sense to me. I never ate green eggs and ham at home, and so it didn't make sense. Number three, Hamlet Shakespeare my senior year taking Shakespeare classes, right, or Hamlet, and learning or figuring out how to understand Shakespeare. As an English learner, being here only five, six years, right? Number four, taking the SAT my senior year. It says daily practice, but I didn't practice. I just showed up to take the SAT. Sat, sit down. <laughs> That's right. That was my style, right? I had, nobody told me that I had to take hours and hours of preparation for the SAT. I was a good athlete, so I was thinking that I could just go to college, you know, because I would run three miles in like 16 minutes and 30, se 30 seconds, just because I was a very good soccer player, that maybe a university would want me to play with them, and they wouldn't care about my SAT scores. And when I score like on the 90th percentile, I was like, wow, I'm so good. I'm in the top 90%. No, it was the opposite. <laughs> so my score was very low. And so I remember being at uh, Fillmore High School, and one of my teachers had gone to UCLA. <clears throat> and he went to UCLA, and he would always say, oh, UCLA was a school that I went to. Oh, UCLA, UCLA. So all of a sudden, I'm starting to think, I want to go to UCLA. <laughs> I want to go to UCLA too. Because if my teacher, Mr. Martinez, wants to go to UCLA, I want to go to UCLA too. So my dream began happening, but 
practicing for the SAT, it was something that nobody told me that I could be part of a program such as AVID. And I remember coming to school in Fremont High School at 7 o'clock in the morning, or 7.10, and I would see all these kids entering a class with Mr. Joe Torres and being in this AVID program. Nobody ever told me that maybe I could be there in that class too. I would just wait and do my homework outside while everybody else was going to college, was going to work at the university. So, next one, Tyson. Then I went to Moore College and I took my first grammar class. And wait, shouldn't I have learned grammar when I was learning English my first three, four years? No, I have never been exposed to a grammar class. And so for the first time I take a grammar class at Moore College and I get a D in that class. And my dream was to go to UCLA. I really wanted to go to UCLA. So after that happened, I said to myself, you know what, I have to focus academically and forget about sports and just focus on my academics and you know, the rest is history. So next one, Tyson. Continue. So then I had to get used to the sarcasm that happened in English. People would tell me, you know, weird things in being sarcastic, teachers, and I would take it seriously. Okay, I'll do it, you know. They were just kidding. And I didn't understand that. So as an English learner, sometimes you face those, you know, idioms or language or sarcastic comments that people make. And so you don't understand. So sometimes you feel embarrassed. And so you never want to participate in class. If somebody makes a comment in class, a teacher or another student, and you feel intimidated, you never want to raise your hand again and say anything else. Next, Tyson. And then comments like this or, or words like this, drug free zone. For me in Spanish it is zona de drogas gratis. <laughs> you can get free drugs right here. <laughs> so those things didn't make sense to me, right? Seeing the signs in the school. Why is there a drug free zone? Or, or drug free weapon school? I didn't understand those things, right? Next one, Tyson. And then open house. You're welcome to the open house. So I'm not gonna open my house? Like, I didn't understand those things. Oh, open house is for my parents to go. My parents never went to an open house, ever. They never got to meet my teachers. When I became a school counselor, that's when I realized, oh, that's an open house. You want people, to, your parents, to come and meet your teachers. So, those little things, hopefully, as you work with English learners, you're encouraged. That's why you always have a very low percentage of English learners in your, in your, in your classes. Open house, what does that mean? You gotta teach the parents what does that mean. You come and meet the teachers on the first day. Continue, Tyson. Other issues I faced, ELD teacher said to me, I am going to teach ELD 3 and 4 in one year. And I want all of you to do your homework and work really hard, and you're not going to be in ELD 3 for one year and ELD 4 for another year. That's too long. You need to be in regular classes. So only a group of students committed themselves to do ELD 3 and ELD 4 in one year. Thanks to that, I was able to take Hamlet my senior year. Otherwise, there was no way I would have been in English 12 college prep. And then sixth period, I talked about the sixth period conflict with track and field. And then I became the homecoming prince. What does that mean? You know, I was elected by all of my friends and everybody to be the homecoming prince. And I missed the ceremony. I didn't go to the football game because I was stand for running across country. So I never experienced what it, was going, what it was like to go to a homecoming dance and all that. And those are issues that happen sometimes to English learners. They never get to experience the activities that happen in the school the way we want them to experience those activities. Because we feel that they are not part of us. Luckily for me, I was able to experience something such as being a homecoming prince, right? So, continue, Tyson. So, one of the things that I want to share with you is that your English learners that are in this district, they already have the grit. They already have what it takes to be the best students that they can be. To be the straight A students, to be B students, to be C students. 
Yeah, some of them may want to be B or F students. But they already have the skills necessary for them to be successful. What is happening is motivation. Who is going to inspire these students to make sure that they come to school every day ready to learn? It will take a village, a community, parents, you as educators, because the reality is that if I will rely on the test scores that I took on the SAT my senior year, there's no way I would have ever been admitted to UC Berkeley, to UCLA, to UC Santa Cruz, Santa Barbara, San Diego. There's no way that if some of the skills that I learned growing up, milking the cows, cultivating the land in Mexico, making a lot of friends and being very social. Those skills allow me to have that grit that allow me to, when I was a student of Fremont High School, and I was connected to all these people that supported me, FLA, uh, my, teacher, my Spanish teacher, my coaches, and different people that allow me to be connected to ways that I could never have been connected unless I had some of those skills. And as an English learner, we always start together. We always travel together. We always ate lunch together. It was really hard to go up to the other students who were in ASB and connect with them, or to connect with the, the, the athletes that were in football, or to connect with the athletes that were in other sports. We stay together. So can you find people in your district that can connect with those students to allow those students to feel welcome in the school? and to find a way to break in between them so that you can get some of those kids and get exposed to other students and the real culture that happens in the schools. Continue, Tyson. So, one of the things that happened to me was this, that I was a really, really good student in high school. I graduated with a 3.86 GPA. But, when I went to the graduation ceremony, I saw, for the first time, a student with an honors sash. They're like, oh, how did you get that? They were like, oh, you're, you're, supposed, you're supposed to take college prep classes and all these classes. Well, I was taking ELD bilingual classes. Even though I was a really good student, I could have never graduated with honors. However, when I went to Mopar College, UC Berkeley was really hard. That one I couldn't graduate with honors. That was really hard. <laughs> the hardest thing I ever done. But then, San Diego State, in season, I was able to be able to graduate with honors. And so, it's really important for you to know that some of your students right now, hopefully they're in college prep classes. And if they're in college prep classes, how can we move those students to regular college prep classes so that those students can have opportunities to go to college? And if they don't go to college after high school, at least they experience what it is like to be in a rigorous class in high school. So that they live at least in high school experiencing a rigorous class and with a, a lot of accommodations, a lot of support. Don't just throw them into college prep classes and don't provide support. You gotta provide the support. Continue, Tyson. And then, if you're able to have a growth mindset, if you're able to have a growth mindset as a student, you're gonna be able to learn some of these skills. As a professional, people believe that effort or practice cultivates intelligence, skills, and talents. There's no way that I, have, I would have been able to go to the White House and introduce Michelle Obama and be called to provide feedback to Michelle Obama's Rich Hire Initiative if it wasn't because of all the work that I have done beforehand. If it wasn't because I always went to summer school. As an English learner, I was told, oh, you, you can go to summer school. Okay, I'll go. I didn't have to go, but I still went. And so, anytime I was able to do a sport, I never say almost no. And, and so I always say yes, 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 yes. And so I was open to always grow. Being here with this hat in Mexico, in the rancho, you know, that was my life. Being at the White House with Michelle Obama, Barack Obama, the Hawks. Meeting the, the, the daughters, right, Malia, Sasha, wow, that was just amazing. So I'm going to show you a video that I have for you. Uh, Tyson, can you click on the picture with Michelle Obama and I are? Yeah, click on that one.
And so this is when I introduced Michelle Obama in Washington, D.C. at a College Opportunity Summit from the beginning. You're gonna need... You can watch this on YouTube. stated, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. In 1981, I was born at home in a small farm in the state of Michoacán, Mexico. I could have grown up to be a farmer. However, in 1993, at the age of 12, my father, a seasonal agricultural worker in California, decided to migrate with our family of seven to this country. Our transition to this country opened the doors of opportunity for my development as a human being and an educated person. As I became acculturated to the new school system, language, and lifestyle in this country, I experienced many academic, language, and social challenges. For example, in ninth grade, I was suspended for three days because I got in a fight inside a classroom. When I got home, my dad said to me, son, I brought you to this country to succeed, not to fail. I brought you to this country so you can get a better education than me. I don't want you to be working on the fields. As a result of that meeting with my dad, I decided to embrace sports, do well in school, in my faith, and in my community. During my junior year, I was chosen by a school counselor to attend a camp organized by a former school counselor on the importance of higher education. Her words of knowledge and inspiration motivated me to be just like her. I went up to Mopar Community College and transferred to the University of California at Berkeley, where I received my bachelor's degree. Determined to be a student advocate, I obtained a master's in school counseling credential from San Diego State University, and recently an administrative master's degree and credential from California State University, and I was also able to study with UCLA, Spain, Morocco, and Portugal. They are all presidents of the universities in the United States. I am a proud professional school counselor at Morpar High School, and I am an advocate for all students, particularly first-generation college students, to have open access to the courses they need to fulfill their post-secondary dreams. On behalf of my colleagues and parents throughout this country who impact the lives of the students they serve each and every day, it is my great honor to be here with you today. I am humble and proud to support the President's College Opportunity Agenda and our First Ladies Rich Higher Initiative. Please join me in the honor of introducing you to the First Lady of the United States of America, a passionate champion and advocate, ensuring every student in this country has the same opportunity to achieve the American dream, Ms. Michelle Obama. She's very tall. And I was like, So, it changed my life. That little moment, those three, four minutes, changed my life. Because from that moment on, I knew that my life was not gonna be the same. When you introduce the First Lady of the United States, it changes your life. In academically, professionally, personally. And so, after that, we got an invitation to go to the White House Christmas holiday party. So, I took my wife, so we both went. And then as a result of that, so many things happen. So, Tyson, can you please click, um, uh, let's see, go back to the previous slide. Click on this picture. Thank you. And this is what happened since then. Nissan selected me as a Hispanic who dominates in the school counseling profession. You can put the sound. Mi papá uh, trabajó por 30 años piscando limón, naranja, un poquito de todo. Mi papá tuvo que realmente hablar conmigo y decirme, si yo te mando a la escuela todos los días para que estudies y quiero que tengas una mejor educación que yo, la educación te abre las puertas y te da tantas oportunidades. Tú como hispano puedes realmente estudiar y tener una mejor vida que uno como consejero escolar tiene la oportunidad día a día de cambiarle la vida a un estudiante del rancho, llegar a la universidad pública número uno en los Estados Unidos es un ejemplo de que cuando tú trabajas duro puede dominar 
todo lo que te propones. Thank you. So, for now on, Tyson, you can just click on the slides and just go one by one, like every five, ten seconds, and I'm going to just share with you five more comments. So, to conclude, what does this mean for you, for me, for all of us? I represent all your English learners. When I was in high school, people did not believe that one day probably I could be doing this type of work. Nobody ever told me, Homero, we believe in you. Nobody said, Homero, you're going to be amazing. You're going to be doing amazing things. Because sometimes we are afraid of telling people, oh, you're going to do that one day. You're going to be amazing. I don't know why. But nobody ever told me that. I had to figure it out myself through programs such as Future Leaders of America, to connecting with somebody else, another friend, another teacher, and so on and so on. So our job as educators, what I have realized over the past 11 years, I have worked as a professional school counselor seven years at the high school level and uh, four years at elementary and middle school level. And one of the things that I realized is that oftentimes we as educators, you know, we do our job to the best of our ability. And our students come to our classrooms, to our offices, and we get to know them. But sometimes we don't really get to know them because it's hard to get to know them personally. So sometimes we don't have to get to know them personally. We can connect them to other people, to other organizations. So there are three things that I would like to share with you to finish that you can do. And I think they are really easy. Number one, can we teach our students resiliency? Can we teach our students to overcome obstacles academically, personally, socially? You have teachers, amazing teachers in your school sites. You have counselors, administrators. You have staff, classified staff. You have an amazing support system. Can you teach these students to make sure that they access all these resources? Number two, passion. Can you inspire your students to follow their dreams, to become passionate about whatever they want to do. If they want to be the best mechanic, let them be the best mechanic. If they want to be the best teacher in the future, inspire them, teach them, coach them to become the best teacher. If you want them to become the best principal, director, lawyer, whatever it is, can you inspire them to follow that passion and connect them? Which leads me to my number three, network. Can you connect these students and provide a network for them so that they can connect with programs in your school, programs in your community, programs outside of your city. I used to go come from Fillmore, Pyro, all the way to Osna, all, all Osna High School to come to meetings. It was through the connection that a bilingual professional instructional system provided to me. If you know programs outside of Osnard, can you connect those students to those programs so they can go there? So the reality is that as you see all these pictures throughout, throughout, this is the story that is behind me. I am not here because of me. I'm here because of so many people that have helped me every day to do amazing work, to experience the best of the best teaching, to experience the best of the best mentorship, and obviously, I was able to meet amazing people throughout that inspire me to do this type of work. So, as I leave today, there are some questions that I have for you. And Tyson, can you go to the last, uh, second to the last slide, where, I know, I know you can probably just click uh, escape, there you go. One more behind, there you go. And there's, there are three questions for you. Number one, can you help students become resilient? as they learn a new language, culture, or face academic, personal, social, and career challenges. Number two, can you inspire students to discover their passions? What makes them really excited and dream without limits? And number three, can you provide a network for them and connect them with the academic, career, personal, and social resources they need to begin building a personal journey and create a family legacy? The reality is that for me, as an English learner, I have not changed only my life. I will be changing the life of my son, who is eight years old, and who already tells me and says, Daddy, I want to go to UC Berkeley. Hello, Dad, son. You got to go to UC Berkeley, right? I'm planting the seed on him already. Whether he goes there or not, maybe Harvard, maybe Stanford. I'm, I'm okay with that. 
And I'm going to build council, right? So the reality is, you have those students in your classrooms every day. If you took the time today to be here at this time, I commend you. Go back to your classrooms and please inspire those students to do those three things. And if you do that, I guarantee you, those students will come to you one day and be like, thank you so much for everything that you did. Everything that you did helped me get here. And I know that's what it did to me. That's how I was able to go from El Rancho to the White House. Thank you.